today. I am here to give you the assurance that I have not forgotten you. If we want to see the new evangelization become more than just jargon, if we want to see it grow legs and gain traction and change the world, we have got to take seriously our responsibilities as husbands and fathers and especially as sons of God. I want to propose to you then that something that our world is desperately in need of in the midst of this crisis is Catholic Christian masculinity. If you want to be a good father, then bring your children to confession with you. I can't get there unless I become a man of ascesis, a man of asceticism, a man of training. A man not doing penance, a man not disciplined, is not a man. You guys have upped your game. You know what, guys, I gotta say, I, I love this the concept of man show. Warning, the Catholic Man Show is about to begin. Welcome to the Catholic Man Show. We're on the Lord's team, the winning side. So raise your glass. Adam Minahan here, sitting with Farmer Dave. It's good to have you on your show. Thank you. <laughs> Glad I was invited back. <laughs> We're again, once again, without Juan. Um, I didn't mean to say his name so like downwardly, like Juan. Juan. Like, Juan. It's his fault. Once again, without. Juan. Juan, Jim is going to be back soon. Talk to him at mass today. He's, uh, he said, Easter he's going to be back. Um, so, yeah, he's out of town right now. He's in he's Houston. Houston, yeah, or somewhere. Somewhere. Sorry, he Jim. might be at home. He could be. Sorry, Jim. Nobody knows. <laughs> so, uh, one thing you don't want to do is break into a bodyguard's house. That is a fool's errand. Yeah, yeah. Get, you get broke. Or something. Or s- something. Something happens. Right. Sure. <laughs> something happens. <laughs> uh, so one of the things that I, I, I've been wanting to do for a while on the Catholic Command Show, and I just forgot, you know, it's we're actually coming into spring. You know, springtime yeah. is here. It and, is here. Uh, through wintertime, I always love drinking a nice glass of port. Mm. And I bought this bottle of port months ago, like in preparation for to have it on the show. It's like cold fire's going pour a nice glass of port yeah you know that's i mean just rings totally and and I, it's delicious and it's delicious and i forgot about it so. you know well, like there are some people who don't like port and i say get out i can't do that because my wife doesn't like port. she does like it she just doesn't want to drink as much as i do <laughs> <laughs> she, she'll take a sip she likes but there are people who say they just don't like it and to those people get out just stop listening that's what i say get out yeah Please, wherever you are. Yeah, I'm just, if you're out, just then get in. I don't care. Or get, or get further out. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> so it's port is it's it's like what do you not like dessert? Yeah. You, I don't know. I just it's, don't understand some people. So this one is Wars Warrior. It's a Porto finest reserve, and it is delicious. We're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. Cheers to Jesus. Cheers. Gosh, it is good. So it says Warrior is a rich, full-bodied port that has uh, been matured in, our, in their cellars to a mellow balance of wild red fruit flavors, supported by a spicy and elegant tannins with a long and satisfying finish. War's Warrior is delicious, served at the end of a meal mm. with rich, res- rich desserts, strong cheese, or on the Catholic Man Show podcast. Yes. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's like, <laughs> I'm sitting here going like, gosh. I don't know if you can actually drink this in Exodus 90 because you have to relax not only drinking alcohol, but also sweets. This is yeah. so delicious. <laughs> it is very good. Dave, so another thing that we're doing, I wanted to, uh, I just briefly brought it up to you right before we, we uh, started the show. But yes. So, uh, maybe somebody of you heard a, a couple of weeks ago we had Ambrosian Candle Company as a, uh, they had a, a commercial on, on the Catholic Command Show. And recently we partnered with them. Ambrosian Candle Company 
what they what they do it's 100 percent beeswax candles beeswax candles uh made by, by a good strong catholic family and um ambrosiancandles.com is the is the uh website how do you spell ambrosian a-m-b-r-o-s-i-a-n ambrosian it's like say ambrose yeah um, but we partnered up with them, and so what we're gonna do? You see these on on YouTube, but they are tapered candles, uh, ten inch tapered candles, prayer candles, one hundred percent beeswax, and we're offering for the next fifty new patrons of ten dollars or more a month for the Catholic Man Show. We're gonna ship you two of these uh, ambrosian candles to to put on your home altar, to put you know to be able to uh, pray with your family, to uh-huh. use them. You know, we've talked about on, on our show many times, and even in our book. You know, when you're praying together as a family, the more smells and bells you can add to to the family prayer life is always a good thing because it in- totally it incorporates more uh, of the family and, and more senses and engages the especially the little kids. Right, yeah. fire is, is very mesmerizing regardless of your age. But um, true, those are, those are beautiful candles. They're beautiful candles. Uh, AmbrosianCandles.com is where is their website. But if you want to get two of them for free as a thank you gift, you can go to patreoncom slash uh, and become a patron of ten dollars or more a month. So they're pure beeswax. They they harvest the bee, the the uh, honey or yeah the honey themselves. Yeah, so they're they're they wax themselves. They're husbands. They're husbandry mm-hmm. of the honey hive. Yes. Uh, and you know, 100% beeswax, so they're gonna burn brighter. They're gonna burn uh, slower. Yeah, they're they gonna burn, they burn a long time. They burn a long time. Uh, they're more liturgically fitting. Mm-hmm. They also have a, a, a nice sweet smell, mm-hmm. like just a. It's, they're not scented. Mm-hmm. Just a natural uh, beeswax smells good when you burn it. Mm-hmm. So for the next 50, I don't know. I don't know how many how long it'll take us to get uh, an extra 50 patrons. But if you've been thinking about supporting the show, you can go to patreoncom slash show. Uh, ten dollars more a month. We'll send you two of those, um, and they're beautiful. You know, um, bees and the liturgy is actually a fascinating history. We don't have time to get into it, but there are many, many people for you know hundreds, hundreds, and hundreds of years have been drawing the correlation between like the cooperative work of a beehive and all the bees and what takes place in the liturgy. And so, talk about it in Compline. Yeah, and so um, this candle right here, that is probably the work of at least a thousand bees over a summer. Wow. Um, or or more, but it, it's just amazing, all of the work. Mm. And uh, beeswax is an incredible, it's just an incredible substance. Well, we love uh, partnering with good Catholic families with, you know, starting little you know, small businesses. And so it was great, an opportunity for us to, to partner with Ambrosian Candles. And, uh, you know, hopefully we, we can get a couple more patrons. All the money that we have uh, that we go to from Patreon, it all goes back into the show. Correct. So like, the reason why we're able to do this is because the people have sponsored our show anyway. So uh, anyway, it, even if you don't buy, even if you don't, I would strongly encourage when you have family prayer together to light a candle. Uh, before you start praying, it really, it really does sets the, yeah. the the tone, the ambiance, and of- it it just establishes a change, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it almost creates a new setting. Yeah, it's just really good. Have this physical thing you do, and I like to do the same thing at meals, right? You sit mm. down at the table. Yeah, you guys are really good at that. And too. yeah, we light lighting candles during dinner. There's just something about it that changes kind of the nature of the environment, mm-hmm. right? Um, and certainly. There's something about lighting a candle, especially for prayer, that uh, kind of draws your mind into. There's something like um, peaceful or like centering. Um, the candle like focuses your attention, and it, you stop. I don't know. It like mm-hmm. kind of prevents distractions. Yeah. Um, there's a there's a whole bunch of reasons why candles are great when you pray. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, can I give a, an update on, on Compline? Yes. Prayer. Oh, yeah. Please do. You know, so one of the things that uh, we did as a family is we started praying Compline together at the end of the evening. Compline is the last prayer of the liturgy, of the hours you know, that um, that you that mm-hmm. monks pray typically, but lady is encouraged to pray as well. Uh, and so one of the things we did for as a practice for Lent with our family, I've talked about before, is is we we pray Compline together. And again, I, I I said this before, but it's worth saying again. You know, 
it's tough at the beginning, right? You try to figure it out. You're going back and forth with one another. Who takes what? You know, and there's certain parts that you don't say right now because it has Alleluia in it, the A mm-hmm. word. Bro. I know, sorry. Um, no, Gosh, sorry. Gosh, dude. Uh, so you have to like, you, you know, there's certain parts that you don't say. So it takes a little bit to get into the rhythm. Uh, we're what? Three weeks in, I guess. How long are we in to Lent? About three, four weeks? I don't know. Yeah, because I'm, I'm thinking about Exodus when 90. When you do Exodus 90, yeah. it's like, I don't know when Lent started. Yeah. I don't know. Um, but they have almost memorized all of Compline. That doesn't surprise me. Like, like First almost of all, the whole it's thing. not too long. It's uh, like, I think it's the shortest of all of the, of all of the hours. I uh, think, I'm pretty sure it's the shortest. Okay. It, I mean, it's not like it's just like. Sex is pretty slow, pretty short, isn't it? It is. It is. Um, and I could be wrong. For some reason, though, I was thinking Compline was the shortest one. Um, okay. But still. It's pretty impressive. Kids, it, kids can just memorize it, stuff. You know, it's multiple. It's it's uh, many verses with it in the Psalms, right? That you're praying yeah. the Psalms. Uh, and then on top of that, you, you know, you're praying uh, uh, Hail Holy Queen. You're praying, uh, you're praying a lot of prayers. You know, the Angelus. Uh, that you want them to get into a rhythm of praying anyway yeah so it's just it was it's been such a great practice I, i've been really pleased with it even though with the rough start very good yeah very good i mean and they they have, like i said they have it basically memorized I, I saw jude the other day like he has this book and he just kind of set it down yeah and i was like about to get on to him but then i waited to see what would happen turns out like he knew it yeah had, basically had all memorized oh dad you don't know it yeah oh no i don't I, I've not memorized it all. But anyway, so we're gonna talk about chivalry today. We're on the Lord's team, the winning side. So raise your glass. I mean, why not? Someday, when I'm independently wealthy. Yeah? I'm going to drink port all the time. <laughs> Someday. When I'm into... It's the- probably like... It probably has a bunch of calories. You'll probably get... You'll probably get really... The diabetes. I'll bet you'll get real portly if you drink too much oh, of boy. it. Yeah, I don't know. Man, it is good. It is so good. I had at Water's Edge oh, yeah. a winery... They have a creme brulee port hmm. that is insane. Like, dude, they're doing so. They're, they're doing so well. Their business is killing. Good. Well, their stuff is delicious. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's expensive, but. Uh, but if you're gonna everything, pay, for everything something, is fantastic. Right? Yeah. If, if if you're gonna pay, expensive, like you want it to be good. Yeah. Oh, and it, it is. I yeah. mean, that's the thing, and it's locally made. Yeah. It's, you know, it's good. it hits all the stuff. Yep. I agree. <laughs> Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles here with Adam Minahan. Hits all the stuff. It hits all the stuff. <laughs> so I, was, uh, I was trying not to laugh about that as we were coming back in. It does hit all the stuff. We were just it's like, off. man, we are so descriptive. Like, we are so articulate. Like, it just hits the stuff. Uh, over the break, we were talking about a local winery here that's really good. It's, you know, it's like, it's not a cheap place is what we were saying. But, you know, you get, what you pay for is so good. And, you know, it it's locally made. Stuff. It's like, and I said, it hits all the stuff <laughs> about, like, local. And then you started the show. Good. Other stuff, <laughs> the other, all the other Things stuff, and you know, it hits it as such, and yada yada. Yeah. So anyway, uh, only farming update I have is um, we have chicks that should be hatching this week, which is okay. very exciting. Awesome. We have a, a broody hen. She's sitting on um, six eggs. I did a flashlight test the other day, um, and only five of them are like i think maybe one of them the chicks the, the chickens they'll like oh find an egg and like bring it with them and when a broody when a hen gets broody she wants to sit on the eggs she will get up once a day mm-hmm. to relieve herself mm-hmm. and eat and drink once a little bit 
and then Man. go sit back on the egg the, on the nest for the rest of the day. So sometimes when she's up, if she sees another egg, mm-hmm. she'll like pick it up and take it with her. They can like hold it underneath their beak hmm. and kind of walk with it. And she's like, now you're my egg. And so I think one got added in there. So anyway, we've got five uh, eggs that should be hatching this week. So it's pretty exciting. Always exciting on, on yeah. the farm. Because I don't believe... On the like, ranch. Is it a ranch? So, uh, we call it Niles Ranch. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, some people, you know, you can order chicks, and that's fine. It's like, it's really che- not a, it's pretty cheap, you know, no pun intended. Um, but the thing is, like, I don't want to, I don't want to care for chicks. It's smelly. You have to keep them inside, or at least in the garage, for like weeks. And it's like, no, I have chickens. Why am I sitting here, like, raising chicks when I have chickens? So that's just kind of my, my, philosophy is that like i'm not going to raise chickens the chickens will raise the chickens and yes i understand it will be less successful you know like it's a price i'm willing to pay yeah ex- exactly because <laughs> like i don't know i don't want to do it that's a shrek like shrek you know that uh, <laughs> the people that, that i'm going to that I, they're like about to go to war and it's like the people i'm about to have killed i'm willing to die, i'm willing to sacrifice this <laughs> So my five chicks, like maybe only two will make it. We'll see. But hey, but it's a price you're willing to pay. Still, we got baby chicks coming. That's that's all I got. So anything else? Let's go. Um, so I want to talk about chivalry today. Um, we're uh, everything a lost virtue. Yes, everything I'm pulling from today is from a book entitled "Chivalry: An Ideal Whose Time Has Come Again" by George of Cappadocia. Yeah, he's. Uh, if you're on X, he's. A Are phenomenal. we really doing that? Are we really like, we're really calling it X? Yeah, that's what I'm doing because that's what it is. I know, but it's dumb. So I just am not over. Well, just go ahead and I'm just not over it. Elon. I I think Elon is like amazing, but I don't like the name. What do you uh, do? You are you Xing? Like you you used to say, oh, I'm tweeting. You're posting. You post. Yeah. See, and it's um, just but he's a great follow Chivalry Guild at Chivalry Guild. So you should go yes. follow him. Yeah, and so this is actually a publication of the Chivalry Guild. Yeah. Which is awesome. So, That's yeah. like well played. Marketing indeed, wise indeed. 100%. Um and so I was really inspired by this book. Um because as I was reading it, I I, I became aware at the at the deficiency of my own understanding of chivalry. Right away, he he addressed he addressed the things that is like oh okay I guess like yes that is he would say like a lot of people think about chivalry as this and I was thinking yeah that's what it is I, I think I'm one of those people isn't that what it is and he's like and then you know very quickly opened up my perspective into actually no so what did you think but, it was um you know it's the being polite. Um, respecting women, um, you know, holding the door for them, giving up your seat, you know, just doing that, like... And those are, ex- like, direct examples he says, he talks about in yeah, the book. Yeah, and, and those things certainly are chivalrous, but that is, those things are not what chivalry is. Um, and so, and that's, those things aren't what make you chivalrous. Okay. There is There is a higher calling to the man of chivalry, the chivalric duty transcends simply giving up your seat or opening a door as lovely and um, respectful as those things are um so anyway basically all of the quote everything we talk about today is going to be a quote from his book um he except for things that we don't quote yeah exactly and then some some of the other things he quotes c.s lewis in here a lot so i'm going to start off with he also is a big fan of the peepster definitely he's a huge peepster fan yeah yeah so that's another plus for him. So he's, you know, he's like, can't be that bad of a guy. Right. You know, but C.S. Lewis says that the essence of the ideal about chivalry is the double demand it makes on our human nature. That man be both ferocious and gentle. You know what this reminded me of? Meekness. Yes. It reminded me very much of meekness. It's like strength under control. There is a, he has a long uh, section on meekness in the book. Okay. Yeah, where he talks about that because 
meekness and chivalry are, have a lot in common, you know, about that. Yeah, I'm not sure what the distinctions are. Well, chivalry goes beyond meek, the meek. Okay. It's Chivalry is like sort of a broad, it's an ideal to strive for, almost like a, uh, like a way of life more than any more than one specific thing uh, it, it's the way you view your purpose in life the way it, it's we were talking about it before the show and i was saying that to me it's almost like it's the male version of virtue that chivalry is it's my opinion that women are not called to, to chivalry men are called to chivalry and it's the the male expression of all the virtues. So it it actually encompasses everything, and that's why it's an ideal to strive for, hmm. because, and he says early on in the book that that no one really ever you don't ever get there, right? It's it's because it's always there's always more, right? You could always become holier, you could always become more virtuous. Um, so that's that's kind of what it is. But I love this the, the idea that C.S. Lewis brings up about the competition between ferocity and gentleness. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't think about the virtuous man being ferocious. Um, but I think he makes a good point here that, well, yeah, I mean, that's it, because you don't think about it, right? In spiritual warfare, I mean, the the virtuous man is ferocious. Right in spiritual warfare, like, it, it's the it, it's fighting the spiritual battles. Totally, and so that's what that's he makes a long point. Like half of the book is about fighting battles, um, and about becoming the kind of man who is prepared to fight, not because you want to fight, but I am ready and willing at all moments to defend the innocent, to stand up for justice and goodness. And I will not. I will not stand idly by. I will not be the man who does nothing. I will be the man that, uh, at the end of my life, can can say, I stood up. You know, I did. I did something, um, out of through charity, mm -hmm. um, justice. You know, all all of the good, the good things. So, um, he says that chivalry is tested every day when a man decides to train and prepare. To become someone evildoers would rather avoid. Yeah, this is one of those, um, man, I can't remember if it was like St. John Vianney or something like that. You know, oh, I think actually in C.S. Lewis, C.S. Lewis talks about this. He says, you know, you either, you want to be the, when you die, you want both the angels and the demons to rejoice, right? You know, the angels to rejoice, uh, no. bringing, you, bringing you up to heaven, like yeah. that you're there, and the demons to say, good, I'm glad he's out of the battle. Right, yeah, I'm glad he's not here anymore. Yeah. Um, I think that that may be. That's, I, don't know. I, I like think that. it is. I like that. Um, so um, he says that the chivalric virtues, also the word chivalric, just a great <laughs> chivalric. Yeah, it's a great word. The chivalric virtues capture the excellences particular to an aristocratic fighting man. And so these are. The, I want to go through the this list here that he has. It's prowess, courtesy, honor, generosity, loyalty, and faith. Okay. Um, so let's start with prowess. Um, he says that the knight fights or stands ready to should a fight be forced upon him. So what he's talking about by prowess is really your ability, your physical strength, and it's not a metaphor. He's really talking about um, your physical training and, and your knowledge of combat, that you are actually a man who has prepared yourself to have a physical altercation with somebody should it need should should the need arise okay do you, do you think you could also just take this as metaphorically also with the spirituality aspect there is certainly a spiritual uh aspect to it no doubt um but in there um which we'll get to where uh so one of the things he says about that comparison because in today's modern era, and I had like, this was totally me. Um, and reading this book is like one of the things that made me say like, you know what? And there's, it's not that the, that's not true about the spiritual component about, okay, I'm ready to do spiritual battle. Um, but 
I think that we are on it. We need to be honest about. Well, there is this other side because we are not just spirits. We are a body and a spirit. And so, both we can't. Our spirit can't act without our body. Our body can't act without our spirit. And so, you can't really divide these things. You have to embrace both at the same time. That I need. If I'm going to have prowess, it needs to be physical and spiritual. So we'll get we'll get to this on the other side of the break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Catholic Command Show. I'm here with David Niles. One of the things about growing in virtue is that you end up knowing thyself better and better. Dave comes over uh, for a baby bottle to my house. And the first thing he says, he's like, Juan and I are sitting there in the kitchen. And he comes walking in and he goes, You know what? I've uh, come to a realization about myself. Juan and I are both like wide eyed, like wondering, like, okay. And Dave says, I've come to the realization that I have strong opinions about things. And I think I'm always right. And one and I like looked at each other like, okay, like thinking this is a punchline or a joke or like Yeah. <laughs> like yeah, we, we have known this Where's the funny part? Yeah. <laughs> but turns out Dave just like wanted to make sure we all knew that Dave has opinions and they're guys, strong. I think stuff. And he thinks he's right. And the things I think they're gold. <laughs> I can't tell you and I'm how. Just, I'm just giving them away for free here on the show. Juan and I laughed about that excessively for the for the week uh, afterwards about how Dave just came sometimes, to the realization. Yeah, sometimes I come on a little. I I, I come off. You know, it's, it's just too strong. <laughs> it's too strong. Can I? Can a man be too strong? <laughs> like I think I'm too strong. <laughs> oh, I I will. Like forever remember that moment. It's like this is like remember the Titans. Yeah. How strong are you? I'm too, too strong. strong. That's such a great movie. That is a great movie. I love that movie. I haven't seen it forever. So I want to get back to this idea about body and soul. Before yes. I do, I want to just read this. Um, holding doors open for ladies is easy. Becoming formidable is not. Anyone who can't or won't fight isn't chivalrous. No matter how big his heart or refined his manners. Not that he should go looking for scuffles, but we must not flinch when they come our way. So th- his point is that if you don't have, if if you Again, can't, this if you is can't, very analogous to the spiritual life. Yeah, there. I mean, there is certainly. Yeah, if you can't fight that battle too, you're also not chivalrous. Um, but he says also that chivalry dismisses the false dichotomies which tell us that moral and physical excellence are mutually exclusive. So he's saying that you can't, and I think we do have a tendency to overemphasize the spiritual excellence. You know, oh, it's just about... Really? In in today's world? I think think in in certain Catholic world. Okay. No, not not in the world. I just mean like in the the Catholic... Okay. um, You know, there is... I was going to say, no, no, no. You get outside the Catholic world, it's totally the opposite. Yeah, I mean, it's all body. There, there is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's all body. Yeah. Yeah. So th- we have to, in order to avoid, you know, because th- the virtue is the middle road, okay? Mm-hmm. So we can't ignore either one. Right. So if, if you think that you want to uh, pursue spiritual excellence, you must simultaneously pursue physical excellence. That your spirit is... W- if your body is weak, your spirit will be weak. Is that like St. Paul? Your flesh is willing. Or your, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak? Yeah. I mean, that's you could use that as a good example. But it's just true that because we're a body-soul composite, you can't do your spirit. Your, like I said earlier, mm-hmm. your, your spirit can't do anything without your body. Your body can't do anything without your spirit. So you have it can't. To, it can die. You have to do, well, okay, great. There's one, Okay, we came up with one thing. So... You're rubbing off it's on me. Just, like, uh, I'm starting to like come up with a, actually. Um, another thing he says in here, which I want to get, which I feel like you're going to like, is he says prowess starts with the simple and wholesomeness of having and admiring heroes. Mm-hmm. 
that in order to pursue this, um, cause it's a daunting thing. Like the idea that I am, yeah. the, I am the man who's going to, right. to fill the gap. Yeah. And it might cost me my life and that I'm willing to lay it down even for like to something that might seem yeah. like it's not worth it. And this makes sense, right? This is why Marvel movies are always so big. This is why, uh, Football like players are always so big. Like sports figures are always so big, mm -hmm. and because like people are are yearning, they see some kind of physical excellence and say like, "Oh, I want to be that." Yeah, you know, that's something that I admire. I admire this aspect of this person. Mm -hmm. um, it can obviously go too far, but I mean, you can always obviously just from our human nature, like, we're always looking to other people, and this is the importance of communion. I mean, we talk about friendship there, but um, and the like and how. Christ is the, the the perfect manifestation of this, like looking to Him as as the perfect example. Uh, but like, like just by nature, we're always looking towards the higher good. Yeah, exactly. And having having those heroes, which for us as Catholics is a second nature. You know, when we right. when we have the saints. Yes. Um, and so that's why, especially the, the in my opinion, the lives of the martyrs. It's so important. I think to know to know the martyrs um because they're the ones who gave everything you know in a very unique and it, like outward way white martyrdom or red martyrdom? i'm talking about red martyrdom okay okay white martyrdom is cool too but red like i think especially for the purposes of our conversation today i'm talking about like Red. I mean, this martyrs. is this is what uh, Bishop Olmsted talked about, like into his apostolic exhortation into the breach. Right. This is why it resonated with so many men, and this is why it was something that uh, men gravitated towards, and mm -hmm. it, it was so successful. Is because we're we are called, you know, to to fight for the good. There's there's good in this life, and it's worth fighting for, you know, as Tolkien would would say. Uh, you know, and so like deep down like we want to fight for the good like we want we want to stand up for uh the vulnerable we want to stand up for those who who like we feel like are less uh ab have less ability than what we do and so we mm -hmm. want to stand up for them by our, our natural instinct right and so it makes sense that prowess has to be like if we're going to do that if this is what like your, your natural instinct is to do you want to be ready for to do yeah. it and you know the idea of prowess is innate in men. Um, you know, we earlier this this year we read the Iliad and the Odyssey, um, and one of the things that, that in in by the, Homer by Homer, right? Um, in the Iliad, there's an idea of uh, sort of like the idea of virtue is this kind of in its infancy, mm -hmm. and at the time, the what they call arete or is like human excellence was only, they only talked about it and refer to your prowess, mm -hmm. your ability, your skill in battle, mm -hmm. right? Oh, you killed how many people, okay? Um, and I only bring that up because I think it's just a natural part of men right. that we have this desire for excellence in a, um, like a physical way, like, like this. Like, yes, I have the ability to like, hold my own defend myself defend my country you know whatever you know i i i can stop you if if you're what you're doing is wrong and there's just a nobility right that i think really does speak to the heart of you know like if you're mm -hmm. if your heart is pumping mm -hmm. like you should feel something about that um so he and that idea of prowess is going to continue on as, as he moves through the other other virtues because he starts with that one for a reason so he's going to move on to courtesy, um, which is, you know, he, that a man treats others with thoughtfulness and grace is what he says. Um, he's like manners. Right. So he uh, quotes C.S. Lewis again. He says, to be a man of both hardihood and good manners. This is the double demand of chivalry that makes the knight a work of art. Hmm. Um. And he's, he says, courtesy is the outward display of a noble soul. Even if we could find a good manual on etiquette, we, sh um, we should turn to it last rather than first. Courtesy requires us to mind the details, but we cannot skip straight from them 
We cannot skip straight to them before establishing the personal frame which gives meaning and effect to everything a man does. Knowledge of the rules does little good without a few prerequisites, which he says are energy, attentiveness, and decisiveness. So what he's trying to say is that um, if you're a low energy, like kind of guy who's just, you're not fit, you're not able to present yourself or be like, um, if you, if you have two people, one person is like an, he's a very, pre like there's something, he has an energy and a presence to him. Like he's really here and he's right there before you. And, um, he is energetically being courteous. And then another man who just simply doesn't break any, like he just doesn't have bad manners, right? There's nothing that you could say that was like uncourteous uncourt about him, right? But there's a, a distinct difference here that the man of energy, the man who's like, because he comes, he's starting off with that prowess, it amplifies his courtesy as well and makes mm -hmm. him like able to like have more of himself to give. Does that make sense? Yes. I, I mean, I think so. Okay. So I, I'm a guy who like, I feel like I'm always wanting more energy. <laughs> I always feel like, man, I just wish I had just a little bit more energy. Maybe that's just like my state in life because I have five children. Right. Um, and that I'm always in a job and like, I don't know. Yeah. So, life. okay. I think I'm glad you said that because I do not think he's talking about like, oh, I shouldn't be tired. Um, because I think what he's saying here is that the, uh, the man of energy, he might be tired, but he has the ability to like rouse himself and be energetic there are some people who are just because they just live a sedentary life i think they just simply don't have the capability of rousing themselves to this like level in order to come like sort of like a performance you know that you're like now is the time for me to rise and, and be does that make sense yeah i mean this is a, the attack of the noonday devil a little bit a little bit of that We'll be right back. The thing is, is like with the Noonday Devil, if you allow the Noonday Devil to win, it turns into much longer than just the Noonday. It's the all day. It's the all day devil. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that is very, like, you want to talk about tough? That's, you want to talk about like growing in heroic virtue? It's slaying that dragon every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's always so personalized. Mm -hmm. It's, I know I don't have to do this. Mm -hmm. and no one's going to know the difference. And right. I'm exhausted and I'm ready to move on. Mm -hmm. But I need to do that and I'm going to do it anyway. Yeah. I totally agree. Someday. I'm going to drink a lot of port. Slay the new day devil. <laughs> Welcome back to the Catholic Man Show. I'm David Niles here with Adam Minahan. What segment is this? Four. This is number four? Yes. I brought us in talking about uh, you yeah. having strong opinions. Oh, that's right. We are not going to get through all of this. That's okay. So um, this is also one, Adam, that when I came to this, I thought, oh, Adam's going to really like this. Ooh. Okay. He says, um, he's, this is still under the under the category of courtesy. He says, so we're talking about chivalry. We're talking about chivalry. Yes. Yep. Um, a man's appearance is loaded with implication. However, adamantly, we insist otherwise. Knightly presentation aims at the golden mean between the excess of dandyism and the deficiency of slovenliness. Mm -hmm. um, totally. I know, like, you're, I, that, you're I mean, big on decorum. I am. Yeah, I am, because, you know, okay, so I think it were, uh, decorum falls under the virtue of religion, which falls under the virtue of justice. Justice is something that you have to give uh, to what is due. Religion is something that you have to give to God, what it is. Uh, you know uh, what he is due and decorum is something that you have to uh show both inwardly and outwardly outwardly uh the right way of presenting oneself to worship in religion out of justice to god mm -hmm. who is your creator and the the source of all goodness yeah and there is these days this idea of 
um, like, oh, if you're focusing on your appearance, obviously it means you're vain. And if you're vain... Are those the ones who think their song is about them? Yeah. The same ones, actually. Um, And to be sure, you could be vainly doing that. Sure. But um, that's not... That's not what we're talking about here, okay? And so I think there's a pushback against that. It's like, oh, you just shouldn't focus on your appearance because I don't want to be vain. But that's not the virtue either. The virtue actually is because no. when you focus on your appearance, it's about others. Well, this is why I said both inwardly and outwardly, right? It's like the outwardly appearance of a sacrament is important because it's a, a it's the outward the manifestation of what's happening internally, right? right. It, it, like from the inside. So like the, the problem is, is like, you don't show up in a suit to go work out unless you're a weirdo. Um, you don't show up in a suit to go to the swimming pool. Right. Right. And it's because, or like, when I meet with a client, I don't wear a suit because I want to show off. I wear a suit in order to show respect and honor to the client that I'm meeting with. Right. Like my, the, the dress shoes I'm wearing is not for me. Right. I would much rather wear boots or tennis shoes or mm-hmm. something else. Mm-hmm. I wear it for them. Right. And so and that's that's the point is that our appearance it need it's it's a it's courtesy or even charity, right? That um you want to show that you are this like the man. everything about what you're doing needs to be that I am the man uh, of virtue and I'm here for you, okay? And it's not about me, but it's, you know, in this case your appearance is always about them. So, um, let's see. Let's move on to honor. Okay. Ron Swanson says, "Ooh, the famous philosopher." Yes, he says, "Anyone needing it defined doesn't have it," <laughs> which I think is true. Like, what what happened? What do you think has happened in today's culture where honor has been so belittled? Um, I don't know. Um. Because it's um, gotten to the point where it's not even it's not even attacked anymore. It's just gone. the The concept of it in young people, like nobody thinks about, or certainly no one talks about, like their honor. Right. That like honor compels me, or their family's honor, or my family's <laughs> honor. Right. Um, that's just an it's a foreign concept. You know what people. what struck me um not too long ago is I was talking to a a, a good friend of mine uh and he had uh, he had recently lost his job. And he was talking to me about it and he was asking for for counseling. He goes like, "Well, I just got let go. How do I tell my parents?" And I was like, well, "What do you mean? You you tell them like I got I got let go." And he was like, "Well, People are going to know this, and my last name is their last name. They're going to find out about it. And so, like, how do I how do I do this without, without dishonoring my parents? And like, I thought, like, wow, that's very interesting. Like that hmm. that you're like you're you're so self aware of like what a sh- what a chivalric thought. Yeah, to say like, listen, I don't want to do damage to my parents' name yeah. Yeah. based off of something. And it, and it wasn't that he got let go for any reason. Like it wasn't like uh, like malpractice or anything like that. I mean, sure. it was just like it, it was just a, a tough situation. But within still, the company. there is it's. But there that is thought, something about that, like oh, because the the thought is I wasn't good enough. You know, right. that's why like I got like I mean, right. and that's not ma- no, that wasn't it's, it. It's not but, true, but just the probably, thought process but. of like I like something bad happened to me, and like not thinking about me, but thinking about, about like my, my family name, my family name, and I thought like man. That is just something that it's, is. It's a very, it's very pious of him. Yeah. It was like that's just something that is is so lost in our culture today. Yeah, that's incredible. So, so I don't know what happened because World War Two, like that generation, they still had honor. It seemed uh-huh. like. Yeah. I wasn't around. It seems um, like they did. It seems like that they did. I think it was the seventies, man. I think in the seventies. I just 70s, like get so tired of blaming everything on the late sixties uh, and seventies. But yeah, that's when it all. I mean. A lot of stuff. I don't know, if, like, if it it was their fault, but that's when a lot. That's when a lot of it happened. Okay, that's when a lot of it. The the sexual revolution really did destroy the fabric of, um, like a lot of a lot of our culture, a lot of the good things about our society. I mean, not like there were there were problems, but before that, but still. 
Yeah, like she ate the apple or she ate the fruit. Yeah, exactly. And he allowed it. Oh, man. So, um, George of Cappadocia. I love that that's the name of his, his, his author's name. Um, when he's talking about honor, he sums it up this way. Don't disgrace yourself. And it's like, yes, okay, that's a very simple way to think about it. Hmm. Just don't disgrace yourself. A man of quality should feel in his bones that a certain conduct is beneath him. Yeah. Think about I mean, that. I, I, that. It's like... I mean, this is what I'm trying to teach my kids all the time. Mm-hmm. I Like my oldest is like, set the example. There are certain things that kids do, you know, that you don't, you should not do because you're older than them. Yeah. You, you should not go down. This is the whole problem with, I think, modernity is that we're always looking downwards instead of upwards. We're always like saying like, oh, well, the the animals are doing certain things. And so like, it should be a natural thing mm-hmm. for humans to do this. It's like, no, we should be looking upwards. upwards. Right. Like, this is the first time in human history, I think, that we're looking, we, we, we de- like, so we're do de- we want to be like the animals? We're descending, yeah. like, instead of ascending. Well, maybe, I don't know if it's the first time, but it does seem like that's what's happening. Yeah. 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 So, um, and he also talks about magnanimity, um, which obviously- Greatness the, of soul. Greatness of soul. Um, he says, a magnanimous man has the boldness to seek great things and make himself worthy of them. Yeah. And then um, he goes through, like, that's Peeper. Yeah, he, it, yes, that is that is P- Joseph Pieper. Um, and he talks about how pride, you know, versus magnanimity. A lot of people are kind of, they shy away from that idea of magnanimity because they're afraid it's a prideful. It sounds like pride, right? but it isn't. We've done a whole episode on magnanimity you can go back and listen to. A couple to. times. Um, he also talks about how honor always seeks a worthy opponent, which I thought was um, very... Like, Honorable. A very interesting thing about... Um, he actually quotes Nietzsche. Pummeling, pummeling a weak opponent is simply beneath those with an honorable nature because there's nothing to be won in such an unequal contest. And it's like a lot of these things, like, yeah, totally. Just never really thought about that very much. Um, let's. Uh, he talks about generosity, but let's skip that and go to loyalty. Um, You're not going to give generosity its due? I think that it's like, yeah, they're generous excellence in giving in time talent and treasure I just since we only have a, a like a little bit of time left okay um i want to talk about loyalty so of all the chivalric virtues loyalty clashes hardest with the spirit of our age because it poses the most fundamental threat to the modern man's quasi sacred commitment to maximal choice at every moment yeah i think mean, uh, loyalty to me is so tough now i don't know what has happened in modern like times with loyalty but it, it it just has been lost right even yeah. in the business world it's like you used to have loyalty to a company the company would repay you by by being loyal to you not letting you go move, you know hiring within moving you up the, the the chain of command so to speak and you'd be you know you you could you could actually go from you know uh, pushing the broom to a higher level executive position yeah. you know in 30 years or whatever uh, same way with with even sports. It used to be like a guy would start, you know, his professional career with the Dallas Cowboys, and want to stay with the Dallas Cowboys his whole professional career. Well, he actually used he tells the story of Pat Tillman. Yeah, in, in, um, in this, uh, uh, you know, rest in peace. May you know played at Arizona or Arizona State? I don't remember. Yeah, Arizona State. And uh, he was too small, not fast enough. No, so like nobody thought, oh, he's not going to be good in the pros. But he, you know, entered the draft. And was picked in the last round by the Arizona Cardinals mm-hmm. because they thought, okay, this is a local guy. Maybe we can get some play. But he was just the guy who was like, oh, no, I'm always – no one is going to work harder than me. He's the Rudy Rudiger. Totally he is. Yeah. So anyway, he ended up starting in his first mm-hmm. game on 9-11. And so after his, th- his three-year contract was up, um, the so, you know somebody offered him $9.2 million. It's a lot of the money. Cardinals offered him the league minimum, five hundred and twelve thousand, and he stayed with the Cardinals. He gave up nine point two million dollars, and took five hundred and twelve because he said these are the guys who gave me a shot when nobody else would. 
Well, then he ended up going... Uh, and then after 9-11, he dropped out of the NFL to go join the military to defend his homeland, what he viewed yeah. as defending his homeland. I mean, it's like everything about that guy's life... And he ended up dying there. Everything about his life was loyalty, loyalty, loyalty. I mean, this... If you want, like, a hero to look up to, you could do a lot worse than Pat Tillman. He's got problems, too, I'm sure. Nobody's perfect, but he's got so much to look at, too. Anyway, there's more we're going to keep talking about on the other side. Go check out the podcast. We're on the Lord's team. The winning side. So raise your glass. Man, I didn't know Pat Tillman's story. Oh, you didn't? I didn't. Um, I remember when it happened. Yeah, and it was sad because he got he got ended up getting killed by friendly fire, yeah. and the they tried to cover it Covered up. up. Yeah, and then they actually got caught and admitted, yeah, we tried to cover it up because yeah. he was the highest profile yeah, dude in the military. It. Yeah, because yeah. he's Pat Tillman. He left the NFL. The, they they had bomb you know bombs from a plane rated like uh, down. Yeah, right where he was. was. I mean, it was an accident, but like still it wasn't good. It was not. Yeah, it was definitely bad. Um, but just think about that. I just don't think like, I don't even know how to rebuild loyalty in a culture without being, uh, of high, like in a high place in like either business or a high influential person in society. Because what happens is in a low, like the low, the low society, you know, the, the guys who are starting from the very beginning, you know, from at the, at, at the very beginning of their like career or whatever. They try to give loyalty, right? And they constantly get pushed down. Yeah, I guess they do. I mean, I'm sure some of them do. I don't even know. At that, least maybe. Like, I think in these days, the in people a career, that I hang out with, the, they the, do. The, <laughs> the wisdom, conventional wisdom today is that no, like if you There's get no a, loyalty, if no, you can make another dime, yeah, go. No, that's exactly right. Go, go somewhere else. And so that's why I love Pat Tillman's story about it. He turned down $9.2 million dollars. For loyalty, for the sake of loyalty, mm-hmm. and so I th- that's you have to have stories like this, and we have to tell stories like this, that that show. Be, and maybe people will still say that was a dumb thing to do. A lot of people are going to say almost everybody that's a dumb thing to. The, a lot of there's a large portion of me that says that was a dumb thing to do. There is a small portion of me that really admires him for it. I wouldn't do it. I don't think I would have either. And but I'm saying there is still like yeah. there's something about it that is like wow talk about countercultural yeah I mean talk about but it's I, it's, it's amazing also, yeah so um, I also got problems right another thing he talks about in here is loyalty to place now so, this is something I want to do a whole episode the, on the idea of stability yeah the virtue of stability I really want to have a, a whole episode on stability yeah um. He says that the chivalrous man loves the soil itself as well as the people, customs, institutions, traditions, and history. He doesn't overlook flaws, but neither does he meet them with the fast with the facile critiques of an undergrad. I love that. It's like first of all, his a lot of his uh, vocabulary and language in the book is it's awesome. It's like yeah. oh, what a what a punchy way to say it, right? Yeah. Um, and then so once again, he quotes C.S. Lewis. He says that the feelings about home must have been quite different in the days when a family had fed on the produce of the same few miles of country for six generations. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, it, it. And then he, he he talks a lot about planting trees where you live, and then about almost like your you know when you plant a tree, he says it's almost like you're harvesting time itself, like that you're letting none of it be wasted. As because the tree is just growing all the time, right? And it, it's it's not going to stop. Um, and that when you do things like that, it makes it harder to leave. Um, when you pour yourself into the place you live, this is why I'm such a big proponent of doing as much as you much like doing stuff yourself mm-hmm. um, as much as you can. Mm-hmm. Um, everybody has a different you know like um, amount uh, skill level, right? But um, just don't call it don't call somebody to fix something just because it's broken i mean with youtube these days you can fix it by the time i left my last house you know across the street here i was like man like i put in that garage door owner i changed the siding i redid the bathroom i redid the kitchen i read you know it's like i retextured the you know, like mm-hmm. i was able to look around and there was a deep a deep satisfaction mm-hmm. in knowing that 
I had, you know, it had my fingerprint. I put myself into this built into this place. It wasn't just a house that I lived in that no. I just bought from somebody. Yeah. It was. It became my house. Right. No, know? definitely not. Well, now it's somebody else's house, but I still put that siding up. Okay. Uh, so then, um, he talks. He he goes on to talk about faith. Obviously, how um, which is important. Otherwise, uh, you don't really have chivalry. You have a very well mannered gentleman, possibly, right? Um, but it, he uses he talks about chivalry and the knight. Um, a lot, and he does that I think on purpose to try to like inspire you, right? To call to summon up this nascent manhood in you that has been oppressed by modern life um (laughs) and so faith obviously is is very very important um because that's that's what orients all of these virtues to their to their ultimate good okay that's what it is the it is faith that takes these from just being a natural virtue into a supernatural virtue which we've talked about before on the show um but just for the sake of time I want to get to his six proposals to revive knightly spirit in the church. Okay. Number one, elevate attire at Holy Mass. Yeah. We talked a little bit about already. A sharp appearance conveys purpose and respect, in addition to reinforcing that state in our hearts and reminding us that we are at Mass for a reason. Uh, you know, when you dress up for Mass, it sets it apart. Mm-hmm. It's it, that It's... Something that says, oh, I'm not just going to the grocery store. Mm-hmm. I'm doing something special because I'm putting on my special clothes. It's also uh, a reminder that sometimes a lot of times, or a lot of times, those special clothes or whatever you want to call them. Like, special clothes. Yeah. Uh, they're not comfortable. No. And it's like, but it's, so it's a, it's a reminder. Like, no, I'm doing this for a reason. Yeah. Like, I'm not doing it for me. Yeah. It's, it's. You know, sometimes like having a, a a blazer or a jacket of some sort is like it's hot, like I'm ex- like yeah. I'm sweating over here. You know, a mess. I would much rather have a golf shirt on. Totally, but boomers in their golf shirts. I like. I'm wearing. I, a, I I'm. I like. Oh, wearing I love shirts. wearing golf shirts, but yeah. I don't wear them to the office. Right. You know who does? Not gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> Wouldn't be honorable. <laughs> You're right. It wouldn't be. <laughs> Number two, fast hard. So um, in the book, he has... Like fasting. Like fasting. Yeah, like fasting. Not eating food. Yeah. Um, he has a, a very interesting chapter on fasting. Um, and about like, when he says fasting, he means like eating no food. Mm-hmm. He's not talking about... You know, and I totally agree. the The church now is so, so weak on its requ- what it requires of us, the faithful, when it comes t- to fasting. And um, it's just one of those things that, personally, I think this is why people are not inspired by often the church anymore, because it doesn't it doesn't require it doesn't require anything of you. Okay, and if if there's somebody who who never requires anything great of you, it's an insult because he thinks there's nothing great in you. That's really, that's right or wrong. That's the, um, the takeaway that you're going to like, at least subconsciously like, Oh, this guy never asks anything hard of me. He obviously doesn't think I can do it, Mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that this is just my opinion. I think that the church, the church's opinion. I think that the church uh, is it was a mistake to degrade the fasting regulations the way they have. I I'm not like looking to. I don't like fasting. Okay, and if the, if it was the other way around, I'd probably be complaining about it. Like, oh, I hate fasting so much. Right. You know? But um, it's it, he. I'll just mention this because I thought this was really interesting. I never heard this before. Um, one of the he was talking about some of the health benefits of fasting. Where, you know, after you de- use up kind of the f- n- nutrition that's in your blood, you start, your body starts eating itself, mm-hmm. okay? Um, when that begins to happen, the very first, so it's eating, you're eating your own cells. The cells that get eaten first are the damaged ones. Mm-hmm. And so if you never fast like this, 
it's a natural like it's it's actually a healthy thing that you're it's a way of purging your body of all these damaged cells <laughs> why are you laughing <laughs> i'm thinking about the the do you ever watch cheers yeah so you know they talked yeah, about i used like, to watch it a lot yeah when i was like, younger yeah he's like you know like that's the reason why i drink you know alcohol kills brain cells <laughs> But it kills the weakest one, so I actually get smarter when I drink. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> you know what? I think it's working on this guy. I think Norm Norm yeah. Norm Norm had a, he, he's clearly a good got philosophy. It. He's got it. Yeah. Dude, that was cheers, so funny. Cheers to, to Norm. Norm. Yeah. So anyway, um fast hard. Mm -hmm. Number three, train together. Um, of all the ways that lifting and boxing clubs could invigorate parishes. One of the most important is this is the signal it sends to the spirited boys who are dying to see models of muscular Catholicism in the pews. Wait, lifting and boxing clubs can invigorate parishes? He's, yeah, I mean, like, sure, you could have a like a men's club. I mean, okay. I don't think that you just because you have a lifting club at your parish, it's like therefore going to invigorate your parish, but. Um, He's, I'm sure what he, I think what he means is like of all the ways that it could, you know, there's a handful. The one that's most important mm -hmm. is that when you, the, for those young boys who are of that certain age in your parish, mm -hmm. who really at that moment where, um, you know, they need a male figure. Dad is obviously the male figure in his life, but uh, every boy gets to the point where that actually they need other male figures yes, right of course yeah, they yeah, need yeah. to see that their dad is a part of actually a fraternity mm -hmm. of men mm -hmm. and then that that fraternity needs to be there to welcome them in so mm -hmm. that now they know i too belong yep okay totally. and so uh i think a, a weightlifting or a, like a boxing club or a, a jujitsu i mean that would be awesome for, yeah, for those totally young agree. boys so i think that's a great idea he says, number four, reclaim the vocabulary of the saints. Um, we need to talk about the virtues and show that they're worth striving for. Just make your language holy. Yeah. Talk about that in our book. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's why, we, like, on our show, when we say mass. Our, our book, the Holy Mass, but we talk about uh, living beyond Sunday, making your home a holy place. Yes. I know. We haven't put, we haven't pushed our book. We have a long. book. We yeah. wrote a book. Yeah. You should buy With it. With our wives. With our wives. Which is way better. Totally. But, you know, we don't just say Mass. We say Holy Mass. Right. Because... We don't say the Rosary. We say the, the, Holy, ho Rosary. the Holy Rosary. Right. Yeah. Um, number five, establish a bigger presence in your parish. It's pointless to call for a revival of muscular Catholicism if we're unwilling to establish our presence on parish councils. So, if you're not willing to... If you're not willing to step up, then shut up. Yeah. Um, Dude, I have a hot take that I want to talk about after after the show. Okay. This. All just right. don't remember. Just okay. don't let me forget. Um, and number six, renew. I just said, don't let me remember. <laughs> don't let me forget. You're well. You, I won't. Yeah. <laughs> um, renew veneration of the warrior saints. So um, he says, uh, we need to remember the wholesome effect of old-fashioned hero worship. He puts worship, yeah. you know, in, yeah, yeah. in quotes. Um, and once again, you kind of mentioned about that earlier, but you need to have... A hero. People to look up to, and everybody needs. Like, I don't think you ever. You're never gonna outgrow a hero. No, I mean, you you move on from heroes to heroes, like you know. Yeah. But, but you never outgrow the hero. Like, I always have guys who I look up to in business. I always have guys that I look up to, uh, you know, from from a saint perspective, from an intellectual perspective, from just a philosophy perspective, from theo theologian perspective. Like, there's right. all these different people in my life that I'm like, man, I want to be around this guy more. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether that be uh, you know a saint who has left his writings, like some of my best friends are saints who are, who are dead, you know, um, because like I I literally try to. Like, you know my my one of my favorite things about those kinds of friends, they let me talk the whole time. They never drink any of your whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> they let you drink it all. <laughs> They're just the greatest. They're just the oh, greatest. you guys! But they make you buy it. That's true. Yeah. But that's okay. I'm willing to. <laughs> it's a price I'm willing to pay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, I, like this is why, like Joseph Pieper, like I have this, like, it, like an intimate friendship with him because, like, I have read his writings. Mm -hmm. 
I've read so many of his books that I feel like I know him. Like right. Like like I know how he would respond to yeah, things. Yeah, and you and you do. Right. Yeah, I mean I think you really do. Yeah. And so um yeah, I mean there's I think it's so important and like the thing is if you don't allow your like if you don't set those heroes up for your children, they're gonna pick their own. And you know how they pick their own? From like from modernity. Yeah. So um the big Which take- is not good. Correct. Not at all. Just to be clear. Yeah. I think the big takeaway here is like what I got out of the book was sort of like a mental readiness. Okay. Um, you know, it it's not like I'm going to run out and join a jujitsu gym. Um, or, Good. uh, cause I still want to be able to beat you up. Like it did actually make me think about it more than I had in the past. But, um, what I think it, it made me consider, and this is something we've talked about on the show about different things is how, um, maybe sometimes a, something happens, a moment arises, mm-hmm. and you just hadn't really ever thought of what you would do in this in moment. That moment. Yeah. And so this had happened to me many times where I'd kind of freeze uh, because I'm taken aback and I'm caught off guard. Right. And then the moment passes, and my my moment and my window for opportunity, where either I had an opportunity to um, really speak the like preach the gospel. Get or um, say a kind word, to maybe stand up for something, right? Whatever it is, it passes and it's gone. And you can't like chase someone down the hallway. It's like, oh, what I should have said to you two minutes ago, you know, right. like that doesn't work. Um, so reading this book, I think what it did is it just kind of opened my mind up to being, to thinking about being ready and just deciding in advance. Yes, I am the man. I choose to be the man who will say no. Like I like today, I choose to be that man. That when that moment comes, I won't have to think about it because I've already decided. Right. Who, I've already decided who I am. And it, if it costs me everything, I say yes. I, I, then I will I will hold my head up high I saying say yes. Yeah, yes. Double yes. <laughs> You know, and uh, like that for me was um, big. Yeah. Because now I, I I do have a confidence just that when the moment comes, I'm not going to be ashamed. Because like those You're moments. You're going to be ashamed? I won't be, I won't, it won't pass me and I won't have to be ashamed of not having done something. Mm-hmm. Like those other moments that I mentioned, but like, oh, I just wasn't ready. And mm-hmm. like afterwards, I was kind of ashamed that. I didn't do the mm-hmm. thing that I wish. I wish I had been the man who did the thing I wanted to have done. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so obviously there are many things that might still happen to me where I mess up on, but it is my intent and my earnest desire to be a man of chivalry. Same. Same, same. Good. Ditto. <laughs> what he said. 